My guest on this podcast is Adam Lawrence, based locally to me in Birmingham. He's built a 60 million pound property portfolio and working towards getting that to 100 million pounds. He also has fantastic insight from my economic point of view, really understanding the numbers and data when it comes to property investing. So let's jump straight into the podcast. I always built the business around cash flow because I, that simple rule of 95% of things that go bust is because of cash flow. So we must have cash flow. The hardest bit has been going through finding the realistic landlords because if anyone's ever tried to buy a portfolio, it's harder than buying from a vendor, not just because it's more complex, but your opponent is much more experienced. The reality is your typical landlord still looks like one or two properties, personal name, paying that section 24 tax, and I've only really had negativity. It doesn't yield very well, etc., etc. And you, you, you're still busy working your working your job or running your business or whatever you're doing. And that property's there is kind of like a pension. Adam, so pleased to have you here. We first met. We were saying earlier, probably about 13 years ago at a networking event. You've done amazing things since then. On a mission to build a hundred million pound portfolio. Now, a lot of people say that you're about 60 percent of the way there. So let's take it right back to the beginning. How did you first get involved in property? Well, it was it was uh, thanks to my dad, really, because we met at a network meeting over in Stratford, if you remember, Stratford-upon-Avon. It's actually you were with family, your dad was with you, but somebody else with you as well. Was there three or...? I think it was just me and my dad, because he, at the time, was still working, and he was, he was a tax and trust consultant, so he, he got involved in particularly difficult cases and unpicking them and stuff like that. And so he was going looking for work, and he thought, you know, property and tax and trust that makes sense and he said you know you've always been interested do you, do you want to come along and I was I was interested and obviously as a sort of I'd, I'd watched the financial crash unfold and all the rest of it and was sitting you know thinking well you know prices have come down rental market looks pretty strong and still not building enough houses that's definitely not changed in the last 13 years uh, so so why not come along and give it a go and you were the I can't remember if you were the first or one of the first speakers that I saw. But... I which word when I was first or second at yeah, that day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so that was yeah, that was that was where it started. I did you know six months of of networking um, before trying to sort of make too many decisions, and then sort of put my foot down and got on with it. And what was the 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 first model? What was it that you decided right? This is the thing that I'm going to do. So a lot of the of the time, what was being talked about? Options were being talked about, and then. It Creative was, strategies around controlling property. Yeah, and and also uh, it wasn't called BRR at the time, but you know, momentum or that that sort of get a twenty five percent discount was the was the essential message. And you know, those are the good old days. There were no three percent extra stamp duty. There was none of any of that. So it was a bit easier to make those sort of numbers stack up. And I kind of I went on this bit of a journey where I thought, what I think most people do really. I think why would anyone ever sell a property for less than it's worth? And thought, how, how does that work? And that's often the biggest hurdle most people struggle with when they get involved in this space. And people say, "Oh, you just buy for a discount." Why somebody can sell it to you for a discount? Yeah, absolutely. And I read, I remember reading Simon's Property Magic, and thinking, "Blimey, it's made it sound quite easy in there, you know." But is it really that easy? And then it t- it took a while for the, for me to go through this process and think, "Well, actually," because he explained in there about you know, it's the first time I'd heard the term motivated sellers. I thought, well, that that makes sense to me. I can see why people would would do that. I can see why people would do deals. Um, maybe let's just let's see see how it goes and how do I go about finding them and start the the old fashioned way of shoe leather hitting the agents, hitting the streets, going and talking and looking for looking for deals. And it was you know it was a flat market really back then. Um, started quite close to home. That meaning prices were rising, they were falling either. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, and we, you know, we're not geographically far away from each other. But my first, my first places that I identified to look at closely were Tamworth and Nuneaton, uh, both both to West Midlands way, and they were that's just outside Birmingham. But why, why not kind of so close to one that's literally on doorstep? Why not where you live? So I found I, I I started to look at the demographic side of what area did I want to be in. So at the time, you could still buy in Tamworth below a hundred thousand. And it looked very cheap to me compared to its more expensive cousin, let's say, of Litchfield. And it's literally very bounded by Greenbelt and all the rest of it. And it's very well connected right on the M42 motorway. Massive investment had gone in from John Lewis at Ventura Park, creating a huge store. And I thought, well, I can't compete with the sort of market intelligence that those big companies have. 
but I can piggyback it. So surely it makes sense. What does the rent look like? Looked at the yield, looked at what I thought the prospects were for capital growth. I thought that's a, that's a goer. And Nuneaton really was to hedge my bets a little bit. And they're both at the either end of a, of a trunk road. So contractors could sort of service both. And it made sense. And Nuneaton was, um, I didn't have quite the the capital growth thoughts that I might get from there, although obviously Coventry is nearby, so that was helpful. Um, but also, I thought I can hedge my bets a bit with yield because you could buy some... Ri- I mean, I bought something in the need at the time, two-bedroom house around 50k, something like that. Um, so that it was cheap. It was a fair bit cheaper than Tamworth. And there was some good yielding stock. There's a big hospital there, all the rest of that. So your, your classic sort of infrastructure play with some capital growth layered in and some yield cash flow in the net so it's producing some relatively good income uh, but also you could see the scope for long-term capital growth as well absolutely was the initial plan always a long-term plan that we're going to keep these for the long term and I, I was very fixed in my mindset in the in the older days about what it's a bit like why would anyone sell it at a discount well why would you sell it as a if you're going to be a, a long-term holder it's hassle to buy it there's frictional costs in buying it it's not an enjoyable process selling a house into the open market. You know, auction is auction and it's normally pretty easy, pretty clean, but you've probably got to take a bit of a hit on the price unless you've got something you know is going to auction really well. Whereas into the open market, you get fall throughs, you get this, you get not control at that point once it, you put it on the market market. There's bits you can do, but you can only nudge and influence. You can't you can't control the process. So it's not fun. And also people forget, you know, if you're going to sell it and it's empty, then there's money to be paid every month. There's council. Again, council tax rules have changed in that time since we met. All the rest of that stuff. You think, well, actually, it's a thousand pound a month to keep this empty. That's not funny. Um, and you then, backtracking that, you get to see why some smaller and perhaps less sophisticated landlords get stuck in a trap where they think, well, I've got to, I need to sell this now because I can't afford this thousand pound a month while it's empty. Because I'm on a tracker mortgage and the base rate is high, and and then you think, well, actually, but also they're usually protected by the fact that if they bought it 20 or 30 years ago, even selling what we would call BMV these days, they're still cleared quite a few quid. After paying their capital gains, they're still walking by with a decent a decent profit. Exactly, unless they've leveraged it to the gills, and then they've got a different kind of problem. Is that necessary? Because some people just let that debt get paid down, and either very little debt or or have the original interest only debt, but might be much much lower in terms of long to value yeah I, I, I even if you're sort of up in maybe the northeast where capital values haven't moved on so much if you haven't touched it since 2006 2007 you're in a place these days where there's some equity built in yeah um, yeah and with those purchases initial ones and did you add value improve them or was it a case right they just need to be ready to go ready to tenor so a couple of them i was looking at hmo at the time to to get that extra yield um and so that was the the value adder and those were the the good old days where I think we converted one to HMO for about 15k. Uh, so that feels like yesterday. That tells you it was last decade. Dodging HMOs yep. as well. And we definitely weren't spending 200 grand on each renovation then. <laughs> no, no. And and so they worked and cash flowed really well. Um, and were, they were never empty, uh, the first couple that I did. Um, and so the, that, was that, the, that was the one side of it. And then the other side, uh, it was really looking at, can we have long-term capital growth? But I always built the business around cash flow. Because like that simple rule of ninety five percent of things that go bust is because of cash flow. So we must have cash flow. Yeah, we must have cash flow. And so then, was it a case of just growing and replicating that, or did it kind of evolve over time, or new ideas get introduced into how you building and growing the business? So it was a, it was a funny time at the time because obviously it wasn't very easy to get finance apart from anything else. And until I'd run out of the immediate funds that I could access from sort of friends and family and things like that. That's so, what started the first few deposits to get going. Absolutely. And I had a little bit of capital myself, but it was only when I ran out that, I, and I felt like, oh, I haven't planned this very well, have I? Because now I've got no, I've got income. Great. But I've got no capital. So how am I going, what am I going to do? If I sit and wait until that income builds up the next deposit, it's going to be a couple of years before I do anything. Which so, was the, the old school method many people used to do anyway. It's just you save up, put a deposit down, buy another one. And, you know, over 10 years, it might be four or five houses they've purchased. Well, that's it. And I suppose I could have gone and said, right, OK, let's find my value in the job market and done something I probably wouldn't have enjoyed that much, but it had thrown off more cash to put into the next deposit. But I didn't really want to go down that route, to be honest. I wanted to, to do my own thing. Um, and so it was a case of, right, OK, well, actually, I've got income. 
and it's it's pretty stable you know there's there's several properties so it's not like that's gonna there might be one room empty or one one flat empty or something but it's not going to cause a big so planning your cash flow generally quite well exactly and if i can live without touching that perhaps i use some of that cash flow to serve as interest on debt so i can take in some debt shorter term longer term and i can service the interest from the cash flow i've got coming in and now when i started doing that i thought right this is the next level I needed to get to. Hey, if you're enjoying this podcast, you'll probably realize that Adam and I both met at a networking event. We're both big fans of surrounding ourselves with like-minded people and creating a community uh, around us. So if you want to meet and connect with like-minded people, I've got some great news for you. We hold our monthly networking event here in Birmingham. We have up to about 200 people each month who'd like to meet, network and connect with each other. I'll be sharing some knowledge on stage as well and also have some great guest speakers as well, sharing their knowledge and expertise as well. So make sure you book on, we'll put the link just here and link it in the description as well and i look forward to seeing you at the next networking event so what that did that brought you more cash in as capital in order to to keep growing exactly so a really simple level if you were paying one percent a month and you had a couple of thousand quids worth of cash flow then let's say you again keeping it really simple let's say half of that could be safely used for servicing debt so i can spare a thousand pounds a month so i can borrow 100 grand at one percent a month now, I'm going to pay the 100 grand back at some point, so I do need to think about that. But if I can rotate and add value and use momentum, and that was a, a the first sort of game changer, really, for me. And then and also bringing in JV partners, who in the first place, I probably made the mistake of, of letting them dictate, did they want to do debt? Did they want to do equity? I wasn't particularly sophisticated around that stuff. I was quite good at understanding the corporate structure and protecting myself. But I wasn't good at kind of asserting and going out and raising debt or raising equity. I wasn't going to them with a proposal. They were coming to me saying, I've got money. You seem like you know what you're doing. Let's let's do something. Yeah. And are those early uh, fundraising activities, I think many people go and most people go through the phase of, as part of the deal, I'll wash your car on Saturdays and I'll take the dog for a walk. <laughs> you will need to do whatever it takes to get that initial money in. That's yeah, that's what, right. And we learn as we go along. Yeah, that's what Fine and Country do, apparently. If they want to list a property, they'll take the dog for a walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's that's so true. And I think the best way to learn is by doing, isn't it, really? And and Nothing beats that. No, no. And the landscape the landscape was different, but certainly I I, I did learn by doing and I'm a continual improver. And I like I like... I like learning. I like education. I like trying. That's part of what I enjoy most about the whole journey, really, because I remember when I first looked into lettings because it seemed to be a good idea to me to have a look. So your portfolio grows to what we need to manage. Well, it, it, it's, I started spending probably about 30% of my focus was going on property management. And I was also had another trading business at the time and I was nicking some of my PA's time out of that business to do to do letting stuff. And I was thinking, this isn't this isn't the best way. This can't be the best way. So maybe I should go and look at lettings and letting agencies must understand best practice. How do they do it? How do they manage property? And then the question I asked myself was should I try and buy one or buy into one or should I start one? And that was that was a, a sort of another step on the road when the portfolio we got to about forty properties by then. So probably I was about five years in, something like that, and got to about forty and thought, yeah, this is stop it. I, I could see very simply, I think the nice way of explaining it is £10 an hour tasks, £100 an hour tasks, £1,000 an hour tasks. And I was getting stuck in £10 an hour tasks. And it was just... Yeah. And it can get to a point where all your time is spent just managing exactly. rather than growing and strategy. Exactly. And that's not why the likes of you and I have done what we've done. We haven't done it to do those jobs, really. We're very happy to lead and inspire and give the benefit of our experience to people doing those jobs. And I, re- I do really enjoy that. I enjoy teaching people how to do things, but I, I'm not necessarily going to enjoy coming in and answering the phone to the leaky tap at nine o'clock in the morning. It's not, not going to not gonna make me want to get out of bed. So at this point, were you already doing BMV type deals or were, is, was that still further down the road? That- so there was certainly, I, I understood the, someone said the old, you know, you make your money on the way in and that stayed with me. And I thought that's great. So one of the things that when I took some debt on on a slightly longer term basis, so not just for one project, but for several years, because I thought, right, I'm going to go through a number of cycles. Cool. Chunk of cash. Yep. And if I leave a bit behind, if I need to pay it off, this event here is going to pay it off or I'm going to sell this property over here and pay it off. So I'm going to use it, 
you know, six, seven, eight, nine times in a cycle and then pay it back. And then I'm going to use that to have bought six, seven, eight, nine properties. So that'll have created all of that cash flow. And then maybe I've got to sell two of those off or three of those off to pay it back. But if I do, I'm still net, you know, three, four, five properties ahead. And then repeated that cycle a whole number of times. So that was, again, a sort of next step along how can I grow a bit faster? How can I start to scale a bit more, but safely within the confines of of um, of not taking any ridiculous risks, I suppose. So it's it's buying them cheap in the first place. Yeah. So there's equity locked in. Yeah. Um, and then uh, do you do you add any value to them, or you just wait and then refinance? So no, we we and this has changed over the last five years, particularly because COVID has changed this significantly. I mean, we would do a lot. 2019, we did a lot of buy at good value. You could argue whether it's 25% BMV or not. And where do you add your... Are you adding £1.50 for every pound you're spending, £2 for every pound you're spending, something like that. But one way or another, it washed out and we, we achieved a 28% discount overall over the course of that year, over 103 deals. So really, really... The, the machine was singing. Everything worked really well. And then we really ramped it up and scaled in this case of, right, this is the criteria. We need to find these that fit the model... Um, and you've got process of acquiring them, getting them up and running, uh, and the refinance. I'd, I'd spend that time, so, so 2017, probably 50-ish, 2018 was more like 75. We did the 100, thought, right, can we do 200 next year? Little thing came along called COVID, which everyone will remember, and I thought, suddenly thought, right, scramble. What's going to change? What's going to happen? Where are we going to go with all of that, and how does this change the business model, of course? Um, and spent a lot of time looking at, because we quite quite good on the sort of data collection and analytics side but this was something i had never planned for you know so i then was looking around at what people were saying you might remember at the time people saying the market's going to go down 40 percent i mean 40 percent incredible incredible numbers and that's quite depressing when that's you know you're at 62 percent loads of value or whatever it's all gone right it's all gone um and so i thought right i'm i'm not sure a lot of this is right and because i'd done a lot of um, economics and stuff in, in my background, in my academic background, I then started, th- I thought I was looking around for people I could really trust at the at the business or at the economic level and, and I couldn't find them. So I thought I'm going to have to really get stuck into this myself. And it really rekindled my passion for a lot of that stuff as well. And so I started looking into my own, you know, forecasts and predictions and what's really going to happen, you know. What was your background and economic interest because that's something quite unique that you you tend to yeah. so do is really get into the economic data of property which very few people do you know, what 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 were you doing previously that kind of transition across into property so i always knew data was important and i remember like what i said early on where i looked at tamworth and the data and the demographics and things like that. so i was always you know led a, a relatively high level by pretty pretty basic really demographic analysis but my, first, my undergraduate degree was in philosophy, politics, and economics, and most of it was economic. My majority was economics. I dropped politics after the first year. I decided that just wasn't really for me, and kept on philosophy on the minor side and and economics on the on the major side. Um, and then I did an MBA uh, around the sort of same time that we met, about a year after we first met, and that had quite a heavy economic tilt. And it was different because my undergrads I'd done before the financial crisis. And that happened. And then, of course, I did that. And then COVID, I really needed another degree, to be honest. That's because, you know, COVID <laughs> maybe changed one. <laughs> yeah. COVID's changed things again, hasn't it? And and that was where the, and I think that was part of the, the puzzle and the challenge of, someone said to me when I was looking into lettings years ago, they said, you know, the average letting agency only manages around about 70 or 80 units. And they said something quite, well, it's a, it's a hard truth, but they tend to grow to their level of competency. And I thought, you know what, I've seen that in a number of businesses. I mean, there's obviously a number of reasons why people grow and scale businesses. And often it's not money, really, which is where people get that wrong. It, it, you need There needs to be a passion for something. And I thought, I wonder how far I can go uh, along along this pathway without taking, you know, ridiculous risks to do it. And because COVID came along and it all changed, yeah, economics had to change and Business strategy had to change as well. So what was singing really well in 2019, I started to then apply, right, what's going to happen with... I picked up very early on, like early 2020 on, I started talking about inflation was going to be a problem. And then, of course, inflation being a problem is followed by interest rates being a problem. 
And I'd never traded through that environment. I, I knew about it from the research that I'd done, but I'd never traded in a sort of 5% plus base rate environment. Although my first first block of flat, uh, mixed use block of flats I ever bought was about 6.2% mortgage. So I was conversant with... But it, they were slowly started. declining it, from when you got when you got involved. The rates were kind of averageish, and then they started declining. And this was the first experience of rates now potentially changing. But the market was the market was behind me. There's no two ways about market was behind all of us who had stock at that point. But it was one thing I learned that I was really pleased that I learned when I got rid of those sort of mindset blockers around why does anyone ever sell cheaply was that I learned people do great deals in every environment. Even in 2006, I've now had the privilege to meet. Several people who have done some great deals. And you think, the market was booming back then. How did you do those those deals? But then what that meant is in 2021, 2022, when again, stock was so short and the market was booming, we did some great deals because I didn't let my mindset think, well, we're never going to be able to do that now. It's like, well, how does this... Listen to the... There are no deals out there. You're absolutely right. They aren't on a... Yeah, yeah, That's your belief. Exactly. You're beating before you start. You're beating before you get out of bed in the morning. Yeah, exactly right. Um, So that, that served me really well. Um, but volumes dropped fairly significantly because of the amount of discount we were looking for. And then as the interest rates climbed, the maths, the maths has changed, you know. And going back to what I was thinking and what I talked about in the old days of, yes, it's a long-term capital growth play, but we've got some healthy cash flow. I always knew that sort of pre-08, certainly in London, people would pay into the properties every month. People, the same way they do in Australia, they pay in exactly, and they're getting mortgage relief in Australia for doing it. But at some point, that model falls over and, and there's the things happen, you know. And so I thought, well, we're going back to a not negative cash flow time because the financiers won't allow it apart from anything else. But if the cash flow is smaller, well, is the capital growth going to come back? But actually, the nuance is it's the rental growth that I was on to sort of 12 months ago thinking, this doesn't look great in year one, this deal. But if I'm right about what rents are doing, then in year two, th- two looks okay, three happy i've got it by year five i'm delighted i own it you know and then hopefully in year five i'm also going to be refinancing at a bit of a lower rate you know we're probably we certainly we certainly have peaked in this cycle and you know it's not not unreasonable to think we'll be back down in the sort of sub five percent level it's just we'll be be back in the sub three percent level not unless something significant happens you know like five percent is probably the norm it's kind of been the norm for a very long time but we'll probably end up going forward so there's people maybe watching or listening to this uh, that want to be involved in property for a few years and they've only ever known really, really low risk. But that's not the norm. No, not at all. And, you know, the norm is very much base rate at 3 to three to 5.5%. So we're at the top of the norm at the moment, you know, and we've been, we've been quite high, really. We won't sustain these mega high rates. But, I mean, limited company buy to let at the moment. If you want to pay no fee, you're at a sort of 6.2%, aren't you? That is high. Um, that is going to come back more to the sort of five, four and three quarter percent level, I think, over the next two, three years. Yes. And once COVID had kicked in, uh, you started to reevaluating kind of what you've been doing because you would had this wild old machine creating all this growth. But now it's case, well, actually, I'm going to we'll have to stand the brakes on, maybe revisit what we're doing. And how did that then change during COVID and kind of post COVID as well? Yeah. So... First of all, I backed into a couple of limited company purchases, as in someone showed me a deal, looked at the structure, knew it was in a limited company. And I'd done some training years before about buying limited companies, and I'd I'd not really had the opportunity to do much with it. I had got involved in letting agencies, so I'd done that side of it, but not property limited companies. And then because the stamp duty was out, because there's a number of tax implications in there, it made what was already a pretty good deal into a no-brainer of a deal and so great in terms of you know your stamp duty reductions you can finance them a lot more creatively um the the, the funders understand and they're slightly bigger purchases as well so when you're getting into the seven figure purchases the capital stack changes the way they're slicing all of that changes and that was that was helpful um but really what it boiled down to was they also took between four and 12 months we weren't used to that we're used to very quick trading deals seven 14 day completion stuff like that um so completely the other end of the spectrum legals were expensive complicated there were things being introduced i was thinking yeah you know solicitors are great at telling you what the risk is 
they're not great at telling you what the probability of that risk is or as you say how to mitigate it so you've got to kind of work that one out for yourself generally speaking so a little bit of uncharted territory when but they, they worked out really well um so started looking at doing some more of that but there were constru- there's not there's not millions of them out there um and they're slow burners so we're, we're always working on that stuff but it's a pipeline and it's a patient it's a waiting game um so that that was one thing we started doing but then also i started to think well we need more cash flow i'm coming back to my my original roots of cash cash flow is king so how are we going to get cash flow when the interest rate is six seven percent so are we even because even if we go after back to hmo or something which i'd stayed away from for years because probably one of the biggest mistakes i made was i thought the single room banding was just going to be the end of it i, I thought it was a one-way track and they were just going to keep sort of crushing the HMO landlord towards that. And then, of course, since that's now been defeated as, as completely unfair, that's years of HMO that I, I didn't do sort of thing. And then you flip that. But it sounds like you weren't doing anything. No, 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 no. Very true. Um, but it did it definitely put me off looking at some stuff which I, I wish I had done um, at the same time. And then what also happened is, you know, 2022 came and the energy bills soared and everything else. And it made HMO very, very attractive. All bills included became incredibly attractive. And then, you know, soaring immigration that everybody knows. Most people are coming to the country as a household of one person. Most people are coming to work. Where are you going to live? Where are you going to live? To say HMO. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I missed out on that, that boom cycle. Not that I think that boom is over because I think that, that wave is still is still riding very much at the moment. And it's, it looks a safer, longer term proposition than it has done for a long time. Whereas... You know, some of the other stuff might look at, you know, they've had a go at the, the taxation side of, of furnished holiday lets and therefore SA, and that's changed a bit in terms of, uh, but, you know, demand-wise, demand-side, flexibility of living, flexibility of accommodation, it's not going away. So I don't know what will end up coming of all of that, but, yeah, HMO certainly feels to me like it's got a lot of legs at the moment. So it was either go and do that on a serious scale and kind of, but we, we couldn't walk away from the single let portfolio that we'd built. And I think it's, it can be challenging to manage both because it is a different, it is a bit of a different animal. That you're a lot more active when you're managing an HMO. There's so much more to do. Um, or look at higher yielding, perhaps businesses, trading businesses that were, that were producing some cash that are asset backed generally. So things like care homes would be a great example. There's a property play in there. But there's also a trading business in there. And when you look at the landscape, you know, from a from a personal perspective, I had two grandparents who both went into care. And it's something that I'm passionate about. They were looked after so well. It was a really good experience, which most people think it's going to be a negative experience. There's always stigma around it. And I thought I'd love to be able to replicate that. Um, and from a commercial perspective, the reality is, you know, we're going to add another million people over the age of 85 over the next i think it's 12 13 years that's going to happen so we go from 1.6 to 2.6 and the the population projections are pretty accurate because they know how old everybody who already exists is don't they so so commercially that's an incredibly attractive marketplace and actually at the moment instead we've had care homes closing on a net basis not opening so there's a supply and demand issue which i'd love to try and solve some of and yield wise they work better than a single they're a big HMO, aren't they? They're a big HMO. With about people living together, uh, you've got additional services like people taking care of them. Essentially, it's the same, similar concept. No, no, it is. It's a it's a higher level of service. And the, that higher level of, of effort and service that you put in, the more return you're going to get. That's kind of how business works, isn't it? And then how did it evolve into doing more commercial property? So you kind of care on your kind of, uh, it's a business, yeah, and then now you also do some pure commercial as well. That's right, that's right. So I felt after COVID we needed to diversify, and there was a couple of directions. One was around the doing we'd, we'd done some of you know social housing, um, leasing to registered providers, stuff like that. But I thought there was a point in the pandemic when I thought it's kind of nice that the government are underwriting these rents because this was before furlough or anything like that. So know. was that for the, the involvement in that sector? Was that for the certainty of income or was it because it was a higher level of income that you were able to? It was more the certainty of income, definitely, at the time. Um, although now, again, if you're talking mini-mos and things like that, you can I could get a bit of 
both worlds, you know, because I could get the HMO style return from a minimo without having to do the management layer on top of that, which I didn't really want to do. So that was the that was how I crossed that bridge. And then the and that and that is a quite a commercial way to look at a residential property, as as is care, really. But then when you go to pure commercial, um, it was a, an angle in terms of thinking things like, well, it was fairly obvious office was in trouble, but you can't just write off a whole sector of property like that. You know, office is a big sector. Were small serviced offices in trouble? I didn't really think so. I thought, if anything, pandemic, recession that might or might not come, that brings change, that brings opportunity. So actually, people will be starting new businesses and and sure enough, you know, we, we bought a block which was primarily the economic engine in it, this mixed use site, is the serviced office block. And then the secondary bit, the entertainment centre, some educational bits and stuff like that. But again, it's a bit like an HMO or it's a CMO or whatever you want to call it, isn't it? Uh, occupants, if you like, yeah, you know, the one yeah. building. Yeah, yeah so you've know, got 35 different tenants in there. And so, um, but and also, if anybody doesn't pay, it's a dream compared to a residential uh, situation. So you've got stuff that people demand. We've got it in an area where it wouldn't stack up for Regis or no one's going to build an office block next door or whatever. It was built with grant funded money and we bought it at an absolute fraction of what it cost to build it. And so that made a huge difference. Um, Key the thing that very few people talk about, and especially as you go further up north, often you can buy property for less than what it would cost to build. And that, you know, it's really difficult to get your head around that. You could actually can't build it for for what you're buying it for. It's been a cornerstone of what I've done for a long time, you know. And it, it, I, one property I remember specifically that helped me work this out early on, um, I, I just slightly spread my wings from Burton-on-Trent, moving up the A38, uh, from Nuneaton, sorry, up to Burton-on-Trent, and bought a property near the hospital in Burton that was a classic old Victorian End terrace, lovely big bay window, begging to be an HMO. No problem. Bought that, converted it. And then there was also some development going on in a plot of land behind it. Quite a number of new homes being built, you know, 60, 70 new homes. And I remember thinking at the time, I think that's going to be quite positive. You know, that will help with the valuations and things like that. And then as the automated valuation models have also become more prevalent, I noticed how much the because having bought new houses before and seen how they don't really rise in value particularly quickly, but how much they drag up the value of the secondary market stock, because instead of thinking, well, hold on, that's got to be, because the, they're so expensive to build, even if there's grant funding, well, that's that's selling at 160, but that house is bigger. Yes, it's older, but it's, it's quite a bit bigger and it's 120. And the, the market tends to start to equalise a bit. And I, I started then using that as more of a, a driver, as one of my, Right, I like this area because we've look at these two hundred new homes going in there. It's going to uplift the value of the area, and also it's going to uplift the value of you know flats above commercial and things like that as well. That the little little angles like that. So the the commercial play was diversification within property because I understand it. And again, those sort of sites that maybe you can achieve a fifteen percent yield from, it was interest rate protection as well. Um, and there were a few other little nuances like. What we've ended up doing is running a couple of little trading businesses out of there as well, which is not really what we necessarily wanted to do. But it, the 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 conference centre has you know day facilities. We 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 let rooms buy the half day or whatever, and we do a number of conferences. So again, you've got you've got an SA style, uh, but within commercial and diversity of income streams. Um, you've got things like business rates to contend with that are a slightly different a different kettle of fish. Um, and sometimes the valuation office haven't done the best job in terms of rating rating things, definitely. And we've definitely benefited from leisure having a, 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 a lot of clemency in business rates, which could be coming to an end, and that could change business models. But you've got multi-purpose spaces. And what I worked out that I wish I'd worked out sooner is that the, the entertainment centre could actually be split into smaller business units that were manageable for people who were local entrepreneurs that are small as passionate about something, Personal trainers, for example. How do you help those people be able to afford a, a, the workable space in your in your commercial building of, of a decent size? And we've been able to do that with a number of groups, which has been and also nice nice for the, the local community. There, it's not local to me, but I've become an extended member of that community from doing that. So I also took that on for for learning because 
I knew how to do it, but I hadn't done it. Not in that, and there will never be another site like that. It's quite a unique site. But you said uh, going through the process where the learning is, really. Because yeah. you might have theory, but until you actually do it, you, you don't really get to test that knowledge and is it work like this? And that's where you really understand the nuances in, in yeah. making these things work. Exactly right. Exactly. And it, it seems to me you like the idea of kind of spreading the investments and not having just one model and that's it. Um, so earlier we were talking about the 70, 20, 10 type arrangement. Tell us a, a little bit more about how your thinking works in that perspective. Yeah, so it's something that I picked up along the way and the original sort of 70, 20, 10 I had was 70% decent yielding core engine assets that definitely have cash flow. Sure, 10% of them at one time might be under reefer, void, on the sale market, whatever, whatever. But it's, it's producing everything you need to pay your obligations every month, pay your agents, pay pay your staff, pay whatever. That's that's all in that core engine. And then 20% was more what you'd love your portfolio to look like. Three bed semis by good schools or outstanding schools. So you're, you're taking, you're going to get longer term tenants in. They're going to be quite low effort and the capital growth is likely to outperform your, your core engine. Your, your long-term, long-term capital, capital growth is much, much higher. higher. Exactly. And then 10% would be even higher yielding, but it would be relatively scrappy stuff like shorter lease flats or all sorts of, of angles you might need to take on, things with legal problems, whatever. That that would be the 10% of sort of, so that's really sort of trying to turbocharge the cash flow a little bit to make sure there's always... The slightly enough challenging stuff where the rewards are much higher by yeah. resolving those problems. That's it, that's it. And uh, or, and or you might have to sit on it for a couple of years if you can't get Section 42 to extend leases or all of that is changing, of course, anyway. So uh, that's where we are. So that 20% I was saying to you earlier on, the problem with that is that we used to call it blue chip, which was a little bit of tongue in cheek because we weren't necessarily in the the very best parts of the UK, but they were better pieces of stock, but they might yield five and a half to six percent. Now, when interest rates were four, and as you said, they went down to three and maybe even a little bit lower for us to access as limited companies, they're stacked up okay. You know, they still watch the base and yep. generate some profit. Exactly. And you, you were happy enough with, you know, a smaller cash flow, but it was still there. When you come back to refinance those at six percent and look you can get four point something if you want to pay a seven percent fee but i don't want to give away five years exactly yes so so i look at that and think well a 6.2 that's not a hold and i think it's very dangerous to hold stuff that's negatively geared so you know your interest rate's higher than your yield i would you can do it but it needs to be a small part of what you're doing and it becomes is it worth is the juice worth the squeeze is it worth holding that stuff do I want to really put this, the 70 to subsidise that part of the portfolio? Because I was happy to accept lower returns in the now, but I'm not really happy to accept negative cash for a, for a positive return over time. And my return on equity is not exciting anymore. So actually, maybe it's time to release those. And the landlord for a uh, kind of landscape has changed a lot over the last like 20 odd years uh, and stuff. And, and uh, you know, so the only certainty in this market is constant change. We're just always evolving. And there is, there is nothing that you can say, this is it for the next few years now. And you see uh, landlords starting to sell uh, as well and exit because it's just not what it was. What's your experience of um, uh, landlords exiting the market? I think they've been talking about it since George Osborne's 2015 summer budget. I think talking is not always the same as action, but I think the real bite of the tax changes and we let's call it what it is the hostility really towards landlord from a governmental or towards individual landlords anyway to be clear or towards individual landlords that manage secondary stock they're quite happy with big build to rent landlords that's that's what they want um but it's a pipe dream to think that they can replace the you know five plus million private rental sector homes with you know with build to rent so that's been forced into overdrive by if you remember when, when when good old George did those tax changes, he phased them in over four years because he knew it could be quite damaging, right? And then what really happened is it didn't really bite because over those four years, the interest rate carried on sort of decaying. So yes, it was a pain for landlords, but they were paying base rate plus two. Hurting, but not in real pain. Yeah, they were they were annoyed by what uh, they, they, were, they were. It was not fair to them that they were getting taxed on effectively on turnover more than profit. Um, and you can understand that, but it wasn't causing a real problem. When the base rate went to 5.25, I 
a lot of them, you know, million plus by all accounts are still on these older tracker mortgages. Suddenly it really bites because suddenly within the space of 18 months, it's gone from 0.1 to five and a quarter. Add on their 2% margin or whatever, they've gone from 2% mortgages to 7.25 and section 24 on top. So they can't even expense all of that. And suddenly it's a nightmare. So that has had a massive impact. And the number that came out of that survey which was from Hamptons International, was 160,000 selling up. The problem we have is that all of these figures, when they actually come through in the governmental reports, they're 18 months out of date. And we need to act now if we see opportunity. But you, you, can, you can see left, right and centre. The hardest bit has been going through finding the realistic landlords because if anyone's ever tried to buy a portfolio, it's harder than buying from a vendor, not just because it's more complex, but your opponent is much more experienced. You know, and the idea of the tired landlord, yeah, sure there are. And it, it's a tiring game and people get tired, but it's much less likely that they have to give stuff away. Um, um, they will have built up capital over time on these, so they've got some profit locked in. Yeah. And so they're thinking about, well, they they need to extract that. They've got capital gains they need to pay. So even if they're selling a little bit of a discount, yeah. and most people don't want to sell at discount, why would they? You know, they're not in... Uh, they're not in severe pain that they need to no. uh, sell it. So it's timing that exit for them as well. Sure. Uh, capital uh, gains allowances uh, disappearing uh, as well. There. Absolutely. And uh, it's likely that, you know, capital gains tax probably on the way up, uh, certainly over time. Yes. And one of the things that you've done quite well, we were talking off camera, is that the portfolio is spread wide across the country, up to Scotland and across to Wales uh, as well. How do you find that experience of, working on properties, managing them, the day-to-day -day maintenance, the, uh, the, the the refurbishment when you're hundreds of miles away? So we were at a stage once where we managed, we had our licences to manage in Scotland, Wales and England, right, from our own internal agency. But Scotland particularly, the law is really quite different. And with all of the changes and with the fact that some of our stuff in Scotland, again, during COVID, we agreed a portfolio purchase had quite a bit of LHA stock in it and I think that stuff really is very difficult to manage remotely you need boots on the ground and local knowledge you really benefit from that so we then decided do you know what actually let's transition all that Scottish stock out and we'll we'll stick with managing in England and Wales where of course there are still different rules and there's rent smart Wales to contend with and all the rest of it and when we were talking about this off camera we were saying weren't we the grass can be greener you know sometimes I can look at things oh someone who can you know, the, the portfolio is spread within a five mile radius or whatever. What a great idea. Um, but sometimes we've gone further afield to get those deals where we can get our money back out of. Could we have done 103 deals in Birmingham in 2019 and pulled all our money out? We couldn't. No, if anybody did that, more power to them. But I, I think it's just too competitive. There's too many people who work to a lower margin. Whereas if we were willing to go to places where, and we, we wouldn't like we would buy everything. But if we had a view on like 2019, I had a view Wales was probably likely to achieve reasonable capital growth um, and the, the, the toll had come off the bridge and all this stuff that was still happening. And it, it worked out pretty well. So I was pleased that we did we did get that level of exposure, but it's more costly. You know, if we want to do a viewing, just want to do a viewing, we're using Viewber or someone like that. And there's a cost implication to that that's not the same as someone in the office can whip out in the car. It's probably costing us twice as much money as that is. Um, if we want to do, you want yes, yeah, so, so we tend to do open houses and things like that. If we want to do an inspection, which of course we do want to do, again, we've got to pay a contractor to do that rather than you might get around 20 properties in a day if you've got someone to do it and you, you organise yourself well. Whereas if we do that, 20, 20 inspections, it's going to cost us a lot more than that and they're not going to get around them in a day. Um, so there are cost implications, which mean that you've got to be quite sensible and good at controlling costs as well because you've still got to deliver decent property at the end of the day but you will never get that level of relationship that sometimes is so powerful between a landlord and a tenant that nobody really wants to talk about from the when they're attacking the landlords but I, i've only seen really no i'm not saying i've never seen bad landlords but i've seen landlords who are really there's a real genuine kindness and a bond and i've had tenants like that myself early early days so you know i still speak to today and things like that and basically i did my bit they did their bit. No one was bitter about it. It worked for them at the time. They're now 10, 20, 15 years further on and they've moved on and they own houses and all the rest of it. And there we go. Absolutely. And I think very few people talk about uh, landlording really 
uh, it's it's a business, but it's a service uh, as well. And when uh, you have an instance where a tenant, for example, is not paying rent, it's so difficult compared to any other scenario. It, if you if you took the property context out of it, and it was another situation where somebody had taken on the service and not paid for it, you know, there's lots of recourse available. But actually, in this sector, we are uh, you know we're penalised from many different angles. It's it's incredibly difficult to get your head around that, and I think that part of the diversification route and everything else, you know. If you start getting involved in trading businesses, you're going to have more people. You're going to have more staff. That's going to there's going to be more HR considerations to make. People are not necessarily going to do what they say they're going to do. Landlords sometimes don't. Tenants sometimes don't. Staff members sometimes don't. So a different kind of of headache that you're going to have to deal with on a on a more regular basis. But when you've got good people, the rewards are so good for you and for them. And that's how uh, you know you're trying to create win win partnerships for people on that side of things. But yeah, there's nothing like, you know, the level of defence that people would like to put in for tenants not paying, or some people would like to put in, you know, I don't know how hard they think they can push the sector, because you've still got, I was surprised to read the other day, 94% of all rental property is still in personal names. 94%. And you think, I know the likes of us feel a bit like we live in a bubble sometimes, and it's all limited company. But we are the we're the exception, you know. We're not the. Rule. We, we tend to surround ourselves with people of a like mindset, so we just assume it's the same for everyone. Exactly, but the reality is, your typical landlord still looks like one or two properties, personal name, paying that section twenty four tax, and have only really had negativity, and so out of the last couple of years, have then had the interest rate to deal with. And if you moved out of your house before the one that you live in now. You probably didn't buy that one with investment in mind, so it probably doesn't. It probably fits in my blue chip category. It doesn't yield very well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you, you, you're still busy working your working your job or running your business or whatever you're doing, and that property's there as kind of like a pension. But again, you're not willing to lose 150 quid a month to hold on to it necessarily, um, and certainly not in this day and age when you sit and think, well, hold on, a lot of these, you know, we we got them at 150, they were worth 200, now they're worth 250. You sit at that level and think, well, hold on, there's 100 grand in there. I can do something with that. I can redeploy that. I can, you know, make some things happen. If you make your money on the way in, if you stick with that, you need more capital to keep feeding the front end of the machine. Do you think those smaller landlords, one or two properties, and they have no aspirations of doing more, they've just kind of accidentally ended up with those. Um, kid went to university, was a previous home or whatever it might be. Uh, do you think uh, the government will slowly squeeze those people out of the market? Do you think that's kind of where it's heading? I do, and I I, I worry. I see the idea. I've seen the the concept written down of how the institutions get introduced. You know, and, it, and they're slow. They're very very slow, and we are so far behind other country, other you know Western democracies in terms of how much property is owned by institutions. It, it takes us thirty years to catch up at the sort of pace they want to go, and what. What worries me the most is you never hear any side of the political spectrum talking about the transition. I mean, if this if we say this started in 2015, because I think George Osborne's message was pretty clear, we're nine years in as we have this conversation, you know, nine years in, and we're at about 85,000 built to rent units in a private rented sector that's five and a half million units wide. I mean, it's... They need three, what, 350,000 a year. It's a, it's a pebble. It's an absolute pebble. And so no one talks about the dangers in transition. And I, I think no one no one really appreciates that, again, like you said, you, rent arrears is very different from any other, you know, you choplift in Tesco, hopefully you get arrested. You know, it's it's just not the same thing at all. And there's, there's massive differences in so many parts of property, you know, including, including the supply side is a massive challenge and it's going to continue to be a massive challenge, let alone the amount of old stock we've got, the energy performance, all the rest of it. And if someone just talked about the fact that when a decision is made about extra compliance or extra regulation or anything, I'm not trying to fight that. I'm not against it. As a bigger landlord, it's probably on my side because it probably means another thousand people want to sell up and I might be able to pick up a few deals, right? But they're spending the tenant's money as well as the landlord's. In any other business, people would have no problem with understanding if the price that I buy my rubber in at, and I make wetsuits, let's say, if the price of my rubber goes up, the price of my wetsuit has to go up. It probably didn't go up as much as the price of my rubber. It's going to squeeze my margin a little bit. That is that is economics. That's the game, right? 
but it does put the price of the wetsuit up. So if the price of delivering the rental property goes up, then the price of the rental property goes up. And of course, interest rates had a big, big impact on that. But it's not just interest rate. It, everything else that you introduce, every selective license, every this, every that, it has an impact on rents upwards. Why, don't we, why are we honest about it? In very few landlords that will just absorb all that. Very, very few. Either the, the thinking about exiting and leaving the market, which causes another problem, or that gets passed on in terms of rent increase. And we've seen rents just go crazy in the last couple of years in terms of what the, uh, what the rents are. Yeah. We touched on uh, institutional investors. So we've got the aspirations of like Lloyd wanting to become the biggest landlords in the country, residential landlords, and John Lewis and others kind of jumping into this space. Do you think they've, what is it do you think they've seen now that's encouraging them to get involved in this sector where previously they had no interest in getting involved in residential property? I think they're seeing it as the last bastion of solid, dependable returns because where, what did they used to do? They would look at things like retail property, property funds, where, whereas you see some of these shopping centres and things, assets that have changed hands, they've been sold at less than half of what they were bought for. Yes, they've delivered yield, but commercial has yield-based sensitivity, really significant yield-based sensitivity. They see and they know properties likely to carry on going up in value over time. That much is a near banker, They're, and there might there'll be cycles. You know, there'll be there'll be accelerated bits. There'll be bits like the last eighteen months where it hasn't done so well or has dropped a bit in various parts of the country or whatever. It will be cyclical, but they're taking a twenty, thirty, forty year. And I think, you know, behind the scenes also, the government are saying to them, the water's warm here. We want you guys in there sending very, in fact, above the line, they send pretty positive messaging out to them to say, we want you guys in here. What does it take to get you to deliver? And whether there's promises of future tax breaks or whether that sort of thing is on the cards, it wouldn't surprise me. But what you see more often than not as well is some of these funds buying assets that belong to another fund. It makes a big headline, but you think, well, that's added zero units to anybody. So I'm very glad that Blackstone have got involved in that deal or whatever, and they know what they're doing. So it's nice. If Blackstone are in, you, you're pretty sure you want to be in, and that's that's cool. But it's not delivering 10,000 new units or what, what the government really want and need. So, yes, yeah, uh, it becomes more X buys Y, Y buys Z, whatever, you know. And they're all are still, I think, a little bit scared of the stock that is more than 30, 40 years old because they worry they are taking these long-term views and they sit back and say, well, hold on, the roof's going to need doing at some point. And that's, I mean, you or I may be able to get a friendly roofing contractor to get the roof done for a reasonable price. Um, but somebody else might, someone in Blackstone's HQ is sitting there going, well, these roofs are 11,000 quid or, or whatever they are. And therefore that's got to be done every 80 years. So when you start to amortize all of those bits and if you pay the sort of full value, you know, it costs a lot more for a housing association to do a refurb than it costs for you or I to do it. There's just more layers of people involved. And it's still quite new. It's, we, we haven't gone through a kind of a cycle with these big institutional landlords of their real appetite for this stuff. No, no. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens here. I'd imagine there's an awful lot more money out there than what they can actually park it into. I mean, John Lewis wanted to, you know, you'd think, well, hold on, they've got the property already. They were going to develop all these flats. But you were looking at some of the bill costs they were being quoted we thought, well, this isn't going to work. And sure enough, they and it's happened, is it? We saw them, and that's it. They've yep, sent them up and do it. Not going to happen to it. Too expensive to build. You know, modular is great. You can do modular, you can crane it in. Try doing that in front of a John Lewis store. You know, it's kind of kind of busy places normally, you know. So, it's not, yeah, it's not happening. You've also been a big fan of community and the people who talk about surrounding people around us and stuff. And, uh, you know, you and I kind of love the idea of kind of being around people who are similar, like minded. Tell me a little bit more about the community you've uh, created around you. Yes, yeah, so it was uh, seven years ago now, unbelievably, but seven years ago, thought, right, we want to do something different that's not just networking, that, that provides, adds some real value, and ended up developing into a community. So I had a lot of great conversations with people when I was in the early days of, of starting up my business, and lots of help, deals, contacts, trades, knowledge, all of that. And I was lucky enough as well to get invited to a few sort of private groups that were very much, you know, you have your much bigger networking events that take place across the country or whatever. There's a process that they're following. There's people in the room. They're generally targeting people who are new to property. And then there'll be a few more experienced people in the room. There'll be some service providers. 
And that, that, that serves a purpose. But when you're not new anymore, how do you fit unless you're one of the service providers, you know? Um, whereas I went to these these clothes networks and they were completely the opposite. Quite guarded, very, didn't would never go to the, the bigger sort of corporate networking. And they were, they were very valuable. You know, I met some great people in those rooms. But it was kind of, it's almost like the, the little the little slot opens like, uh, you know, it, I don't even remember how I got my first invite to one of those. And I thought, isn't it a shame that's not accessible to people that you should, you could be able to take those values and make that more broadly accessible and try and do that. First of all, we're all over the country. You know, we haven't managed to do that, but we've managed, you know, presence in the Southwest with Bristol, presence in London and a presence in Birmingham and a, a monthly meeting and then broader you know hundreds and hundreds of hours of video content we video everything we get done we do get people who don't normally do like the networking circuit to come and talk and so there's a, a different feel and it's a bit longer yes and they're, they're daytime as well they're right? daytime mix that's right and then we'll have a, a round table sessions in the afternoon where there's that's not being filmed but it is much more open chat and we get some really quite experienced people we still welcome and attract people who are relatively new to property Absolutely, and we always will. But it's, it's it's created that kind of safe space for people to come to, where they know they can come there every month. They know what they're going to get from it, and they they help each other. It's great to see how much they help each other. So it becomes a concept that's way bigger than a me or a Sue or anybody. It's partners in property, and it's it's its own. And I think the the idea of bringing people together uh, with just the country that brings the people together, and then. Enormous opportunities come from that. People getting to know each other, connecting with each other, you know, learning from each other as well. It's, it's not necessarily a master strategic plan. It's a put good people in a room and good things will happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you've been uh, become phenomenally well known for your uh, economic uh, outlook on the property market. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, I enjoy reading uh, some of them. I, I, I think have a, uh, a, you know, a great insight into the numbers and analyze, which very few people people do. Um, and uh, you also now uh, uh, put some back content out on YouTube uh, as well. Um, so what's the YouTube channel? Let's uh, send some love and subscribe with your way. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, so it's called Proponomics with Adam Lawrence. And so I obviously put property and economics together, Googled it. No one had ever done that before. So I thought, oh, I've got my own word. That's brilliant. Um, and I, I try, I, I always make sure I, I release something on a Sunday morning um, that I've written and then I, I people and obviously lots of people don't really want to read these days they'd rather have the audio or the video content so it turned into a bit of a podcast on the back of that as well and I'm trialing some different things I did a, a little live this Sunday morning to talk through my thoughts and then if anybody wanted to they could sort of jump on and say is that what, what are you trying to do here what are you but I'm, I'm really I'm trying to search for the truth and I'm trying to organize my own thoughts because you know there's a pretty big bat that I'm swinging around. I've got joint venture partners who've got money at risk and want to keep growing the portfolio sustainably. That growth rate has been impacted by COVID, as we were saying earlier, but I need to be on top of what's the next surprise. I don't want to be surprised by the next surprise. When I see the economic news these days, I'm like, I hmm, pretty much knew that was going to happen or I had a slightly different view on what was going to happen. So I developed these longer term views on the interest rate and where it would get to. And it was helpful when last year when we were seeing rates sort of climb up and up and it's like where's this going to stop well it, it showed me I, I called the top pretty much at the top which is not easy to do you know and there, there aren't many people trying to do it either because why are they interested in it but i've been stunned by how many forecasters just throw out a forecast and then just walk away from it and i just think there should be, without the explanation yeah and there should be why yeah why are you thinking you're going to get there and then if you've got it wrong why do, you, that, Why do you think... Uh, we don't learn anything when we get it right, do we? We only learn when we get it wrong. So I'd like to go back and go, what I got wrong there was this. What I didn't see there was this. I should have seen this earlier. And it's helping me to evolve and get, get better at what... Well, because I've got to keep upskilling myself if I'm going to keep growing the business. There's no two ways about it. Yes. And in terms of your thoughts on the next year to next five years, what's your thoughts on the uh, the UK property market? So I'm really bullish on both rent growth and capital growth over the next five one of the mistakes people sometimes make with rent growth is they're talking only about the figures that come out from your Zooplas and home lets and people like that. Well, that's for new lets, right? But really, we should be looking at 
rents for existing lets because most of what we have is not new tenancies every year. That doesn't get reported uh, into your Zoopla data and stuff. It, it very, it, it, there is an ONS rental market index figure, which is relatively new to the market. The, the, the paucity of the data in rental is mind-blowing, really, when you think how big the sector is. And, you know, there's trillions of pounds worth of assets and rents and stuff involved. You know, hundreds of billions of pounds worth of rents. It, it beggars belief, really. Um, but I think rent growth and capital growth will probably about match each other over the next five years. But I think we've obviously got big rent growth at the moment and it's going to calm down. Um, wages are going to calm down, which will also calm rent growth down because one is obviously enabling affordability for the other. But when you look at inflation-adjusted house prices, they are cheap at the moment. They're as cheap as they've been for a long time. The cheapest since 2013. Right, early 2013, when aside from your your London to the world, everything was still pretty flat market. You know, it wasn't going anywhere fast. And they were do. I was I was out there doing a couple of deals in those markets, and remember, you know how relatively flat they were, and they were good for doing deals in. Um, but I, I see a climb on that side of things without a doubt because you've got more affordability now than you've had for some time. The blocker, of course, will remain the interest rate for a while. But people forget that we've been underwritten as a residential buyer. You've been underwritten at a five and a half percent mortgage rate for the last 12 years. Well, that's been the rules that were set into stone by the Prudential Regulation Authority. So if we're under five and a half, people will still be able to afford it. Now, will they want to spend it? And that's no comfort for people coming off a two percent mortgage and going on to a four and three quarter percent one as they are at the moment. But that where is that money still? They can afford it. It just has to come out of their disposable income. And they're not spending it on holidays and whatever other things that they were able to afford when credit was super cheap. But the likelihood is rates are coming down somewhat slowly from here, but that's going to give another runway. We're going to have repeat that cycle that we saw, you know, between sort of 2011 and 2015, 16 before the referendum where there'll be a little burst, gradual rise. And then there'll be a year where everyone turns around and goes, where did that seven, seven and a half percent come from? But it's in the it's in the pipeline, you know. And you're already seeing in real time now, you know, figures agreed per square foot are 5% ahead of where they were five or six months ago. So that that will wash out into the land reg as we go later through the year. But it's it's not easy to try and juggle all of these. Like this morning would have been a great example. There was unemployment figures released and unemployment was up a bit more than expected. But in real time, jobs were being created. But this is the, the unemployment was reported a month and a half in arrears, you know. This is it. So this is why I try and keep keep putting my fingers on the pulse of what's going on in the now. So I'm not going to be. Uh, am I thinking? Oh no, we're heading towards a brick wall. Lots of people are going to lose their jobs. There's there's problems with affordability. I'm very confident that we're not. For example, because I'm on top of of that side of things. Yes, Adam, I've loved this conversation. It's always uh, fascinating listening to you and the insights uh, and your thoughts on the uh, the, the economic uh, market when it comes to property. What's the best way for people to connect with you? So I would say go on to my LinkedIn, Adam Lawrence on LinkedIn, send me a connection request on there, give me a follow on there, or go to the YouTube channel and maybe try and tune into one of the live videos and make a comment and uh, I'll see uh, if I can add any add any value to your questions. Excellent. We'll put the links in on the screen and in the Thank description you. as well for both the, uh, the YouTube channel and uh, also for LinkedIn as well. Appreciate that. Thank you so much.